Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction Company taking a look at some of the guns they're going to be selling in their upcoming February of 2017 regional auction. And today we're taking a look at a Remington 700. Now, you might be thinking, you know, that we've got a lot of electronic technology these days. We've got smartphones that can do all sorts of amazing, unbelievable things. Why is it that we're still stuck with chemical primers and nothing more intricate in a firearm than a coil spring. Well, Remington tried to address this. From 2000 to 2003 they sold this version of their Model 700, the Remington e-tronics, or the way it's spelled the e-tronks, I suppose. And this was an electrical firing system, which actually really cool in concept. So the, what this system is, basically this is a Remington 700 bolt action, well proven, well known, you know, been around for decades, and all they did was change the fire control mechanism. So, although actually that's kind of a lot involved in that. So let's start at the cartridge. In order to make this even quasi viable, they had to make the cartridge at least reloadable. If it was single use only, um, non reloadable ammunition, there was no way the American gun buying public was going to be willing to support it. Uh, people, for better or worse, and I'd kind of say it's often not that practical of a concern, but people have this concern about they'll, they want to be able to be guaranteed that they'll always be able to get ammunition for a rifle. Now in the case of something like this, if you buy a couple hundred rounds, it's really kind of a lifetime supply. If it turns out they stop making ammunition for the gun, well, start shooting something else and save your ammo on this for the actual hunting trips instead of the practice time. At any rate, in order to do their best to get around that issue, Remington made sure that this used all standard components except for primers. So it used the same bullets, the same powder, and the same brass cartridge cases as their regular Remington 700. And this was made in three different calibers, uh, 220 Swift, 243 Winchester, and 22 250. Now the primer that they used, as I said, was a proprietary primer, and instead of being a, an impact sensitive explosive chemical, it was actually basically a one and a half kilo ohm resistor. So when electrical current flowed into the primer, it heated up. Pretty simple, actually not that much more complex than a chemical explosive. Then they replaced the, instead of having a firing pin and a coil striker spring in the bolt, they replaced it with basically a conductive electrode, for lack of a better term. Uh, basically just some way to transmit electrical power from the battery, which is located right here in the buttstock, through up to the chamber. So this is actually fired by a capacitor. Um, in fact it's interesting, the maximum rate of fire of this rifle is one shot every six tenths of a second. Now you can't really work the bolt and try to fire faster than that because it is a bolt action rifle, but it takes six tenths of a second for the nine volt uh, battery in the buttstock to charge a capacitor uh, up to the necessary voltage uh, in order to actually fire. So by having an electrical system you get a couple of benefits. Now on paper, let's go through them, on paper uh, your trigger is no longer a mechanical thing, it's now an electrical thing. So you can set whatever level of force you want to activate the trigger. Now Remington, in theory you could, you know, drop this down to micrograms of pressure to the point where you could literally breathe on a trigger and have it fire. Being more practical, Remington allowed an adjustable trigger that went from uh, half a pound up to about two and a half pounds, and you could set it wherever you liked in that range. The other advantage you get is something called lock time. Now lock time isn't, here's <laughs> the problem with this rifle is that lock time doesn't really matter much. Um, it was a big deal for say flint locks and percussion guns, and the idea of lock time is the, the time that elapses between when you actually pull the trigger and when the bullet actually starts moving. So a flint lock for example has a very long lock time because you pull the trigger and then the flint has to come forward and then it makes sparks, the sparks then have to ignite the primer charge, which goes sizzle sizzle woof if you see it in slow motion, and then that fire goes through the fire hole into the main charger powder which then ignites and then the bullet gets going. So it takes a lot of really good follow through um, in order to shoot a flintlock accurately. With a modern cartridge firing gun your lock time is the time it takes when you pull the trigger you then are, you're dropping the sear, 
and you then have a striker or a hammer that's accelerated by a spring right into a fire into a primer which primer detonates and then the main charge fires. This happens very quickly, uh, so quickly that it's not that big of a deal. What Remington did with this rifle was reduce the lock time by something like 97%, down to just a couple milliseconds. Which is awesome, that's not a bad thing, it's just, it's an answer to a question pretty much nobody was asking. Especially in the form that they have here, which is basically a hunting rifle. The only people who are really actually practically concerned about lock time are the really serious bench rest shooters, who are shooting, you know, these 25 pound single shot rifles off of concrete sleds, that sort of thing. For them, lock time makes a difference. For the rest of us, not so much. And that, coupled with the fact that Remington priced this, the MSRP was $2,000, which was exactly double that of a regular Remington 700 at the time, is kind of is this, it really is an answer to a question that nobody was asking. Who's interested? And when you combine that with this kind of knee-jerk paranoia about any electronics in a firearm, well, it led to the gun being not very successful, let's put it that way. All right, so we've got our new Remington e-tronics here. Let's see how it works. There are a couple things we're going to need. We're going to need a 9 volt battery to power it. We're going to need the safety key. This is very important. Do not lose the safety key because this is your rifle's on-off key. If you lose it, the rifle no worky. So, we actually start by installing a battery. The battery goes under the butt plate. A pair of Phillips screws. There's the battery compartment. We'll take our 9 volt battery. We have negative and positive. Battery fits right in like that. And then we'll put the butt plate back on. Oh my, it is, it's blinking at me there. One, two, three, four, five. Now the owner's manual has a guide to the various error codes that this rifle can give you by way of its signal LED. And uh, if I take a look at five blinks in a row, it tells me that this is the error for having installed the battery with the rifle in the fire position. So here's our manual safety and sure enough it's in fire. So the fix is apparently to cycle it into safe and then fire, no, I'm sorry, I have to turn the rifle on and then cycle it through. So here on the bottom of the pistol grip we have a little lock and I have my key and I need to put that in and turn it on. And then I can cycle this to safe and back to fire and it should stop blinking at me. Excellent, okay, now we're ready to go. There are a couple things about this rifle that they make sense when you think about them, but you just don't expect it, because of course you're used to handling normal rifles. For example, when I unlock this, it's nice and light, there's no spring tension, and in fact I can close the bolt without any spring tension either, and it kind of feels like, you know, when you, when you just do that the first time you think, oh, something must be broken in there, and then you realize there is no striker spring. So this whole cock on open versus cock on closing, you don't ever cock this rifle, because it's electronic. You can see a little electrical contact right there. Another interesting little feature is the sound of the trigger. So I'm going to lean in really close and see if you can hear this. It sounds like a mouse click. I don't know if that came through on camera, but you don't have this sharp mechanical reset and, and click like you're used to in a normal gun, because of course, again, there isn't any, there are no springs attached to this, it's just a little electronic switch. In order to remove the bolt, I have to press up this little tab and then pull the bolt out. We've got that. So we've got some, some gunk in the breech face there, but it looks like it has a normal firing pin. It actually doesn't. That's not a firing pin so much as it is an electrical contact. It's heavily insulated so that it doesn't uh, discharge power out into the bolt body or the other metal parts but only directly into the primer, and that uh, insulating, that's a ceramic insulation, lasts about 7500 rounds, at which point it will have basically been electrically burned off and you'll need a new firing pin. Of course, I think if you put 7500 rounds through a normal Remington 700 you'll probably end up needing at least one replacement firing pin for that as well. Now the way this worked in practice was that the light stayed off until you had a round chambered and the safety in the fire position. And then the LED would come on, 
and after you fired, the LED would go off. So basically this light came on to alert you any time you had a live round in the chamber ready to fire. All right, and then when you're done shooting, turn the rifle off, take the key out, that preserves your battery life, and uh, go about your business. You would clean this like any normal rifle. Now I know some people are going to ask about all sorts of various apocalyptic things. So first off, Remington did harden the electronics in this against things like heat, cold, and humidity. So they did in fact make this a, a pretty resistant, resilient firearm. You really didn't have to worry about the electronics uh, failing on you uh, in typical field use. Now I know someone's going to ask, what about an EMP? Would that knock out your rifle? And the answer is, I don't know, and I don't particularly care, and I think it's kind of a, a preposterous situation. Uh, I can't frankly imagine anybody who would pay $2,000, buy a Remington e-tronics, and have it be their only firearm. So in this one in a gazillion chance that in fact the Russians decide to launch an all-out nuclear war and start with an EMP strike, and then you happen to survive and you need your hunting rifle afterwards, and you only have this rifle, then I suppose EMP might be a problem. Uh, I think I am more concerned about what happens if I'm, well, struck by lightning while being attacked by a shark and a polar bear at the same time. That's probably a slightly more likely scenario, and also one in which I would need my Remington e-tronics and might not be able to use it if I got struck by lightning. So in practical terms, this thing worked just fine. It was simply a problem of being in a question, like I said, that no one was asking at the time. So the question is, why would you want this rifle today? And there are a couple reasonable answers. One is, it's a cool piece of firearms history now. Sooner or later we will get electrically controlled firearms, and they're going to be pretty cool. If our smartphones are any indication, by the time people are figure out how to do it and are willing to do it, and there, yes, I admit, there are some legal issues surrounding semi-automatics with electrical firing systems and the definitions of machine guns and all that, but sooner or later we will figure out a way around or through those problems, and when we do, electrical firearms are going to be pretty darn awesome. And at that point, this will be that cool first generation thing that's really cool to have. Now, it's also still actually a feasible rifle. I did some browsing around uh, online sites, places like uh, Gunbroker, before I filmed this video, and it turns out, yeah, you can actually still get the ammunition. You're going to pay probably a dollar to two dollars a round, as of the beginning of 2017 when I'm filming this. You're going to pay a buck or two a round, which for a hunting rifle, that's really not that much different than what you're going to pay for any sort of decent soft-tipped hunting ammo in any cartridge for any normal gun. So. Uh, you could at one point, up until apparently fairly recently, you could also get the Etronics primers. They're substantially more expensive than regular primers, but you could get those in flats of a hundred or cases of a thousand, and that, that would let you reload plenty of ammunition. So for a hunting rifle this is still totally viable, I think. You know, you don't need, you don't need to have crates and crates of ammunition socked away for the apocalypse for your electric hunting rifle. If, I suppose if the apocalypse happens you can find some other gun to use instead. So I think they're pretty cool, uh, I think they're a neat, they're a gun that's on their way to being forgotten now. So if you'd like to get this one, um, it is actually in a lot with a second Remington e-tronics. Most of the guns in this regional auction are batched together in groups. Uh, if you take a look at the description text below, you'll find a link to Rock Island's catalog page for this one and its sister. Take a look at their pictures, the other guns that come in the batch, uh, price estimate for the whole lot, and if you decide to take a swing at it yourself you can place a bid right there on Rock Island's website or on the phone during the auction live. Thanks for watching.